This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. God and the State by Mikhail Bakunin Chapter 2, Part 1 I have stated the chief practical reason of the power still exercised today over the masses by religious beliefs. These mystical tendencies do not signify in man so much an aberration of mind as a deep discontent at heart. They are the instinctive and passionate protest of the human being against the narrowness, the platitudes, the sorrows and the shame of a wretched existence. For this malady, I have already said, there is but one remedy, social revolution. In the meantime, I have endeavoured to show the causes responsible for the birth and historical development of religious hallucinations in the human conscience. Here, it is my purpose to treat this question of the existence of a God, or of the divine origin of the world and of man, solely from the standpoint of its moral and social utility, and I shall say only a few words to better explain my thought regarding the theoretical grounds of this belief. All religions, with their gods, their demigods, and their prophets, their messiahs and their saints, were created by the credulous fancy of men who had not attained the full development and full possession of their faculties. Consequently, the religious heaven is nothing but a mirage in which man, exalted by ignorance and faith, discovers his own image, but enlarged and reversed, that is, divinized. The history of religion, of the birth, grandeur and decline of the gods who have succeeded one another in human belief, is nothing, therefore, but the development of the collective intelligence and conscience of mankind. As fast as they discovered, in the course of their historically progressive advance, either in themselves or in external nature, a power, a quality, or even any great defect whatever, they attributed them to their gods, after having exaggerated and enlarged them beyond measure, after the manner of children, by an act of their religious fancy. Thanks to this modesty and pious generosity of believing and credulous men, heaven has grown rich with the spoils of the earth, and by a necessary consequence, the richer heaven became, the more wretched became humanity and the earth. God, once installed, he was naturally proclaimed the cause, reason, arbiter, and absolute disposer of all things. The world thenceforth was nothing. God was all. And man, his real creator, after having unknowingly extracted him from the void, bowed down before him, worshipped him, and avowed himself his creature and his slave. Christianity is precisely the religion par excellence, because it exhibits and manifests to the fullest extent the very nature and essence of every religious system, which is the impoverishment, enslavement and annihilation of humanity for the benefit of divinity. God being everything, the real world and man are nothing. God being truth, justice, goodness, beauty, power and life, man is falsehood, iniquity, evil, ugliness, impotence, and death. God being master, man is the slave. Incapable of finding justice, truth, and eternal life by his own effort, he can attain them only through a divine revelation. But whoever says revelation, says, revealers, messiahs, prophets, priests, and legislators, inspired by God himself. And these, once recognized as the representatives of divinity on earth, as the holy instructors of humanity, chosen by God himself to direct it in the path of salvation, necessarily exercise absolute power. All men owe them passive and unlimited obedience, for against the divine reason there is no human reason, and against the justice of God no terrestrial justice holds. Slaves of God, men must also be slaves of church and state, in so far as the state is consecrated by the church. This truth, Christianity, better than all other religions that exist or have existed, understood, not accepting even the old oriental religions, 
which included only distinct and privileged nations, while Christianity aspires to embrace entire humanity. And this truth, Roman Catholicism, alone amongst all the Christian sects, has proclaimed and realised with rigorous logic. That is why Christianity is the absolute religion, the final religion, why the apostolic and Roman Church is the only consistent, legitimate and divine Church. With all due respect, then, to the metaphysicians and religious idealists, philosophers, politicians or poets, the idea of God implies the abdication of human reason and justice. It is the most decisive negation of human liberty and necessarily ends in the enslavement of mankind, both in theory and practice. Unless, then, we desire the enslavement and degradation of mankind as the Jesuits desire it, as the Momias, Pietists or Protestant Methodists desire it, we may not, must not, make the slightest concession either to the God of theology or to the God of metaphysics. He who, in this mystical alphabet, begins with A, will inevitably end with Z. He who desires to worship God must harbour no childish illusions about the matter, but bravely renounce his liberty and humanity. If God is, man is a slave. Now, man can and must be free. Then, God does not exist. I defy anyone whomsoever to avoid this circle. Now, therefore, let all choose. Is it necessary to point out to what extent and in what manner religions debase and corrupt the people? They destroy their reason, the principal instrument of human emancipation, and reduce them to imbecility, the essential condition of their slavery. They dishonour human labour and make it a sign and source of servitude. They kill the idea and sentiment of human justice, ever tipping the balance to the side of triumphant knaves privileged objects of divine indulgence. They kill human pride and dignity, protecting only the cringing and humble. They stifle in the heart of nations every feeling of human fraternity, filling it with divine cruelty instead. All religions are cruel, all founded on blood. For all rest principally on the idea of sacrifice, that is, on the perpetual immolation of humanity to the insatiable vengeance of divinity. In this bloody mystery, man is always the victim, and the priest, a man also, but a man privileged by grace, is the divine executioner. That explains why the priests of all religions, the best, the most humane, the gentlest, almost always have at the bottom of their hearts, and if not in their hearts, in their imaginations, in their minds, and we know the fearful influence of either on the hearts of men, something cruel and sanguinary. None know all this better than our illustrious contemporary idealists. They are learned men who know history by heart, and, as they are at the same time living men, great souls penetrated with a sincere and profound love for the welfare of humanity, they have cursed and branded all these misdeeds, all these crimes of religion, with an eloquence unparalleled. They reject with indignation all solidarity with the God of positive religions and with his representatives past, present and on earth. The God whom they adore, or whom they think they adore, is distinguished from the real gods of history precisely in this, that he is not at all a positive God, defined in any way whatever, theologically or even metaphysically. He is neither the supreme being of Robespierre and J.J. Rousseau, nor the pantheistic god of Spinoza, nor even the at once imminent, transcendental and very equivocal god of Hegel. They take good care not to give him any positive definition whatever, feeling very strongly that any definition would subject him to the dissolving power of criticism. They will not say whether he is a personal or impersonal god, whether he created or did not create the world. They will not even speak of his divine providence. All that might compromise him. They content themselves with saying God and nothing more. But then, what is their God? 
not even an idea. It is an aspiration. It is the generic name of all that seems grand, good, beautiful, noble, human to them. But why, then, do they not say man? Ah, because King William of Prussia and Napoleon III and all their compeers are likewise men, which bothers them very much. Real humanity presents a mixture of all that is most sublime and beautiful with all that is vilest and most monstrous in the world. How do they get over this? Why, they call one divine and the other bestial, representing divinity and animality as two poles, between which they place humanity. They either will not or cannot understand that these three terms are really but one, and that to separate them is to destroy them. They are not strong on logic, and one might say they despise it. That is what distinguishes them from the pantheistical and deistical metaphysicians, and gives their ideas the character of a practical idealism, drawing its inspiration much less from the severe development of a thought than from the experiences, I might almost say the emotions, historical and collective as well as individual, of life. This gives their propaganda an appearance of wealth and vital power, but an appearance only, for life itself becomes sterile when paralysed by a logical contradiction. This contradiction lies here. They wish God and they wish humanity. They persist in connecting two terms which, once separated, can come together again only to destroy each other. They say in a single breath, God and the liberty of man. God and the dignity, justice, equality, fraternity, prosperity of men regardless of the fatal logic by virtue of which, if God exists, all these things are condemned to non-existence. For, if God is, he is necessarily the eternal, supreme, absolute master, and if such a master exists, man is a slave. Now, if he is a slave, neither justice, nor equality, nor fraternity, nor prosperity are possible for him. In vain, Flying in the face of good sense and all the teachings of history, do they represent their God as animated by the tenderest love of human liberty. A master, whoever he may be and however liberal he may desire to show himself, remains nonetheless always a master. His existence necessarily implies the slavery of all that is beneath him. Therefore, if God existed, only in one way could he serve human liberty, by ceasing to exist. A jealous lover of human liberty, and deeming it the absolute condition of all that we admire and respect in humanity, I reverse the phrase of Voltaire and say that, if God really existed, it would be necessary to abolish him. The severe logic that dictates these words is far too evident to require a development of this argument, and it seems to me impossible that the illustrious men whose names so celebrated and justly respected I have cited, should not have been struck by it themselves, and should not have perceived the contradiction in which they involve themselves in speaking of God and human liberty at once. To have disregarded it, they must have considered this inconsistency or logical license practically necessary to humanity's well-being. Perhaps, too, while speaking of liberty as something very respectable and very dear in their eyes, they give the term a meaning quite different from the conception entertained by us, materialists and revolutionary socialists. Indeed, they never speak of it without immediately adding another word, authority, a word and a thing which we detest with all our heart. What is authority? Is it the inevitable power of the natural laws which manifest themselves in the necessary concatenation and succession of phenomena in the physical and social worlds? Indeed, against these laws, revolt is not only forbidden, it is even impossible. We may misunderstand them or not know them at all, but we cannot disobey them, because they constitute the basis and fundamental conditions of our existence. They envelop us, penetrate us, regulate all our movements, thoughts and acts. Even when we believe that we disobey them, we only show their omnipotence. Yes, we are absolutely the slaves of these laws. 
But in such slavery there is no humiliation, or rather, it is not slavery at all. For slavery supposes an external master, a legislator outside of him whom he commands. While these laws are not outside us, they are inherently in us. They constitute our being, our whole being, physically, intellectually and morally. We live, we breathe, we act, we think, we wish, only through these laws. Without them we are nothing. We are not. Whence then could we derive the power and the wish to rebel against them? In his relation to natural laws, but one liberty is possible to man, that of recognising and applying them on an ever-extending scale in conformity with the object of collective and individual emancipation or humanisation which he pursues. These laws, once recognised, exercise an authority which is never disputed by the mass of men. One must, for instance, be at bottom either a fool or a theologian, or at least a metaphysician, jurist or bourgeois economist to rebel against the law by which twice two make four. One must have faith to imagine that fire will not burn nor water drown, except, indeed, recourse be had to some subterfuge founded in its turn on some other natural law. But these revolts, or rather these attempts at, or foolish fancies, of an impossible revolt, are decidedly the exception, for, in general, it may be said that the mass of men, in their daily lives, acknowledge the government of common sense, that is, of the sum of the natural laws generally recognised, in an almost absolute fashion. The great misfortune is that a large number of natural laws, already established as such by science, remain unknown to the masses, thanks to the watchfulness of these tutelary governments that exist, as we know, only for the good of the people. There is another difficulty, namely, that the major portion of the natural laws connected with the development of human society, which are quite as necessary, invariable, fatal, as the laws that govern the physical world, have not been duly established and recognised by science itself. Once they shall have been recognised by science, and then from science, by means of an extensive system of popular education and instruction, shall have passed into the consciousness of all, the question of liberty will be entirely solved. The most stubborn authorities must admit that there will be no need either of political organisation, or direction, or legislation, three things which, whether they emanate from the will of the sovereign or from the vote of a parliament elected by universal suffrage, and even should they conform to the system of natural laws, which has never been the case and never will be the case, are always equally fatal and hostile to the liberty of the masses, from the very fact that they impose upon them a system of external and therefore despotic laws. The liberty of man consists solely in this that he obeys natural laws because he has himself recognised them as such, and not because they have been externally imposed upon him by any extrinsic will whatever, divine or human, collective or individual. Suppose a learned academy composed of the most illustrious representatives of science. Suppose this academy, charged with legislation and the organisation of society, and that, inspired only by the purest love of truth, it frames none but laws in absolute harmony with the latest discoveries of science. Well, I maintain for my part that such legislation and such organisation would be a monstrosity, and that for two reasons. First, that human science is always unnecessarily imperfect, and that, comparing what it has discovered with what remains to be discovered, we may say that it is still in its cradle, so that were we to try to force the practical life of men, collective as well as individual, into strict and exclusive conformity with the latest data of science, we should condemn society as well as individuals to suffer martyrdom on a bed of procrustes, which would soon end by dislocating and stifling them, life ever remaining an infinitely greater thing than science. The second reason is this. A society which should obey legislation emanating from a scientific academy, not because it understood itself the rational character of this legislation, in which case the existence of the academy would become useless, 
but because this legislation emanating from the academy was imposed in the name of a science which it venerated without comprehending such a society would be a society not of men but of brutes it would be a second edition of those missions in paraguay which submitted so long to the government of the jesuits it would surely and rapidly descend to the lowest stage of idiocy but there is still a third reason which would render such a government impossible namely that a scientific academy invested with a sovereignty so to speak absolute even if it were composed of the most illustrious men would infallibly and soon end in its own moral and intellectual corruption even today with the few privileges allowed them such is the history of all academies the greatest scientific genius from the moment that he becomes an academician an officially licensed savant inevitably lapses into sluggishness he loses his spontaneity his revolutionary hardihood and that troublesome and savage energy characteristic of the grandest geniuses ever called to destroy old tottering worlds and lay the foundations of new he undoubtedly gains in politeness in utilitarian and practical wisdom what he loses in power of thought in a word he becomes corrupted it is the characteristic of privilege and of every privileged position to kill the mind and heart of men the privileged man whether politically or economically is a man depraved in mind and heart that is a social law which admits of no exception and is applicable to entire nations as to classes corporations and individuals it is the law of equality the supreme condition of liberty and humanity the principal object of this treatise is precisely to demonstrate this truth in all the manifestations of human life a scientific body to which had been confided the government of society would soon end by devoting itself no longer to science at all but to quite another affair and that affair as in the case of all established powers would be its own eternal perpetuation by rendering the society confided to its care ever more stupid and consequently more in need of its government and direction but that which is true of scientific academies is also true of constituent and legislative assemblies even those chosen by universal suffrage in the latter case they may renew their composition it is true but this does not prevent the formation in a few years time of a body of politicians privileged in fact though not in law who devoting themselves exclusively to the direction of the public affairs of a country finally form a sort of political aristocracy or oligarchy witness the united states of america and switzerland consequently no external legislation and no authority one for that matter being inseparable from the other and both tending to the servitude of society and the degradation of the legislators themselves does it follow that I reject all authority? Far from me such a thought. In the matter of boots, I refer to the authority of the bootmaker. Concerning houses, canals or railroads, I consult that of the architect or engineer. For such or such special knowledge, I apply to such or such a savant. But I allow neither the bootmaker, nor the architect, nor the savant to impose his authority upon me. I listen to them freely, and with the respect merited by their intelligence, their character, their knowledge, reserving always my incontestable right of criticism and censure. I do not content myself with consulting authority in any special branch. I consult several, I compare their opinions, and choose that which seems to me the soundest. But I recognise no infallible authority, even in special questions. Consequently, Whatever respect I may have for the honesty and the sincerity of such and such an individual, I have no absolute faith in any person. Such a faith would be fatal to my reason, to my liberty, and even to the success of my undertakings. It would immediately transform me into a stupid slave, an instrument of the will and interests of others. If I bow before the authority of the specialists and avow my readiness to follow, to a certain extent and as long as it may seem to me necessary their indications and even their directions it is because their authority is imposed upon me by no one neither by men nor by god otherwise i would repel them with horror and bid the devil take their counsels 
their directions and their services, certain that they would make me pay by the loss of my liberty and self-respect for such scraps of truth wrapped in a multitude of lies as they might give me. I bow before the authority of special men because it is imposed upon me by my own reason. I am conscious of my inability to grasp in all its details and positive developments any very large portion of human knowledge. The greatest intelligence would not be equal to a comprehension of the whole. Thence results, for science as well as for industry, the necessity of the division and association of labour. I receive and I give, such is human life. Each directs and is directed in his turn. Therefore there is no fixed and constant authority, but a continual exchange of mutual, temporary and above all voluntary authority and subordination. This same reason forbids me, then, to recognise a fixed, constant and universal authority, because there is no universal man, no man capable of grasping in that wealth of detail without which the application of science to life is impossible, all the sciences, all the branches of social life. And if such universality could ever be realised in a single man, and if it be wished to take advantage thereof to impose his authority upon us, it would be necessary to drive this man out of society, because his authority would inevitably reduce all others to slavery and imbecility. I do not think that society ought to maltreat men of genius, as it has done hitherto, but neither do I think it should indulge them too far, still less accord them any privileges or exclusive rights whatsoever, and that for three reasons. First, because it would often mistake a charlatan for a man of genius. Second, because, through such a system of privileges, it might transform into a charlatan even a real man of genius, demoralise him and degrade him. And finally, because it would establish a master over itself. To sum up, we recognise then the absolute authority of science, because the sole object of science is the mental reproduction, as well considered and systematic as possible, of the natural laws inherent in the material, intellectual and moral life of both the physical and the social worlds. These two worlds constituting, in fact, but one and the same natural world. Outside of this only legitimate authority, legitimate because rational and in harmony with human liberty, we declare all other authorities false, arbitrary and fatal. We recognise the absolute authority of science, but we reject the infallibility and universality of the savant. In our church, as in the Protestant church, we have a chief, an invisible Christ, science. And like the Protestants, more logical even than the Protestants, we will suffer neither pope, nor council, nor conclaves of infallible cardinals, nor bishops, nor even priests. Our Christ differs from the Protestant and Christian Christ in this, that the latter is a personal being, ours impersonal. The Christian Christ, already completed in an eternal past, presents himself as a perfect being, while the completion and perfection of our Christ, science, are ever in the future, which is equivalent to saying that they will never be realised. Therefore, in recognising absolute science as the only absolute authority, we in no way compromise our liberty. I mean by the words absolute science, which would reproduce ideally, to its fullest extent and in its infinite detail, the universe, the system or coordination of all the natural laws manifested by the incessant development of the world, it is evident that such a science, the sublime object of all the efforts of the human mind, will never be fully and absolutely realised. Our Christ, then, will remain eternally unfinished, which must considerably take down the pride of his licensed representatives among us. Against that God the Son, in whose name they assume to impose upon us their insolent and pedantic authority, we appeal to God the Father, who is the real world, real life, of which he, the Son, is only a too imperfect expression, whilst we real beings, living, working, struggling, loving, aspiring, enjoying and suffering, are its immediate representatives. But, while rejecting the absolute, universal and infallible authority of men of science, 
we willingly bow before the respectable, although relative, quite temporary and very restricted authority of the representatives of special sciences, asking nothing better than to consult them by turns, and very grateful for such precious information as they may extend to us, on condition of their willingness to receive from us on occasions when, and concerning matters about which, we are more learned than they. In general, we ask nothing better than to see men endowed with great knowledge, great experience, great minds, and above all, great hearts, exercise over us a natural and legitimate influence, freely accepted and never imposed in the name of any official authority whatsoever, celestial or terrestrial. We accept all natural authorities and all influences of fact, but none of right. For every authority or every influence of right, officially imposed as such, becoming directly an oppression and a falsehood, would inevitably impose upon us, as I believe I have sufficiently shown, slavery and absurdity. In a word, we reject all legislation, all authority, and all privileged, licensed, official and legal influence, even though arising from universal suffrage, convinced that it can only turn to the advantage of a dominant minority of exploiters, against the interests of the immense majority in subjection to them. This is the sense in which we are really anarchists. The modern idealists understand authority in quite a different way. Although free from the traditional superstitions of all the existing positive religions, they nevertheless attach to this idea of authority a divine and absolute meaning. This authority is not that of a truth miraculously revealed, nor that of a truth rigorously and scientifically demonstrated. They base it to a slight extent upon quasi-philosophical reasoning, and to a large extent also on sentiment, ideally, abstractly, poetical. Their religion is, as it were, a last attempt to divinize all that constitutes humanity in men. This is just the opposite of the work that we are doing. On behalf of human liberty, dignity and prosperity, we believe it our duty to recover from heaven the goods which it has stolen and return them to earth. They, on the contrary, endeavouring to commit a final, religiously heroic larceny, would restore to heaven that divine robber, finally unmasked, the grandest, finest and noblest of humanity's possessions. It is now the free thinker's turn to pillage heaven by their audacious piety and scientific analysis. The idealists undoubtedly believe that human ideas and deeds, in order to exercise greater authority amongst men, must be invested with a divine sanction. How is this sanction manifested? Not by a miracle, as in the positive religions, but by the very grandeur of sanctity of the ideas and deeds. Whatever is grand, whatever is beautiful, whatever is noble, whatever is just, is considered divine. In this new religious cult, Every man inspired by these ideas, by these deeds, becomes a priest, directly consecrated by God himself. And the proof? He needs none beyond the very grandeur of the ideas which he expresses and the deeds which he performs. These are so holy that they can have been inspired only by God. Such, in so few words, is their whole philosophy a philosophy of sentiments, not of real thoughts, a sort of metaphysical pietism. This seems harmless, but it is not so at all, and the very precise, very narrow and very barren doctrine hidden under the intangible vagueness of these poetic forms leads to the same disastrous results that all the positive religions lead to, namely the most complete negation of human liberty and dignity. To proclaim as divine all that is grand, just, noble and beautiful in humanity is to tacitly admit that humanity of itself would have been unable to produce it. That is, abandoned to itself, its own nature is miserable, iniquitous, base and ugly. Thus we come back to the essence of all religion. In other words, to the disparagement of humanity for the greater glory of divinity. And from the moment that the natural inferiority of man and his fundamental incapacity to rise by his own effort, unaided by any divine inspiration, to the comprehension of just and true ideas are admitted, it becomes necessary to admit also 
all the theological, political and social consequences of the positive religions. From the moment that God, the perfect and supreme being, is posited face to face with humanity, divine mediators, the elect, the inspired of God, spring from the earth to enlighten, direct and govern in his name the human race. May we not suppose that all men are equally inspired by God? Then surely there is no further use for mediators. But this supposition is impossible, because it is too clearly contradicted by the facts. It would compel us to attribute to divine inspiration all the absurdities and errors which appear, and the horrors, follies, base deeds and cowardly actions which are committed in the world. But perhaps then only a few men are divinely inspired the great men of history, the virtuous geniuses, as the illustrious Italian citizen and prophet Giuseppe Mazzini called them. Immediately inspired by God himself, and supported upon universal consent expressed by popular suffrage, Dio e Popolo, such as these should be called to the government of human societies. Footnote In London, I once heard Monsieur Louis Blanc express almost the same idea. The best form of government, said he to me, would be that which would invariably call men of virtuous genius to the control of affairs. End footnote. But here we are again fallen back under the yoke of church and state. It is true that in this new organisation, indebted for its existence like the old political organisations to the grace of God, but supported this time, at least so far as form is concerned, as a necessary concession to the spirit of modern times, and just as in the preamble of the imperial decrees of Napoleon III, on the pretended will of the people, the church will no longer call itself church. It will call itself school. What matters it? On the benches of this school will be seated not children only. There will be found the eternal minor, the pupil confessedly forever incompetent to pass his examinations, rise to the knowledge of his teachers, and dispense with their discipline. The people. Footnote. One day, I asked Mazzini what measures would be taken for the emancipation of the people once his triumphant unitary republic had been definitely established. The first measure, he answered, will be the foundation of schools for the people. And what will the people be taught in these schools? The duties of man, sacrifice and devotion. But where will you find a sufficient number of professors to teach these things, which no one has the right or power to teach, unless he preaches by example? Is not the number of men who find supreme enjoyment in sacrifice and devotion exceedingly limited? Those who sacrifice themselves in the service of a great idea, obey a lofty passion, and, satisfying this personal passion, outside of which life itself loses all value in their eyes, they generally think of something else than building their action into doctrine, while those who teach doctrine usually forget to translate it into action, for the simple reason that doctrine kills the life, the living spontaneity, of action. Men like Mazzini, in whom doctrine and action form an admirable unity, are very rare exceptions. In Christianity also, there have been great men, holy men, who have really practised, or who at least have passionately tried to practise, all that they preached, and whose hearts, overflowing with love, were full of contempt for the pleasures and goods of this world. But the immense majority of Catholic and Protestant priests who, by trade, have preached and still preach the doctrines of chastity, abstinence and renunciation, belie their teachings by their example. It is not without reason, but because of several centuries' experience, that among the people of all countries these phrases have become bywords. As licentious as a priest, as gluttonous as a priest, as ambitious as a priest, as greedy, selfish and grasping as a priest. It is, then, established that the professors of the Christian virtues, consecrated by the Church, the priests, in the immense majority of cases, have practised quite the contrary of what they have preached, this very majority, the universality of this fact, show that the fault is not to be attributed to them as individuals, but to the social position, impossible and contradictory in itself, 
in which these individuals are placed. The position of the Christian priest involves a double contradiction. In the first place, that between the doctrine of abstinence and renunciation and the positive tendencies and needs of human nature, tendencies and needs which, in some individual cases, always very rare, may indeed be continually held back, suppressed, and even entirely annihilated by the constant influence of some potent intellectual and moral passion, which at certain moments of collective exaltation may be forgotten and neglected for some time by a large mass of men at once, but which are so fundamentally inherent in our nature that sooner or later they always resume their rights, so that when they are not satisfied in a regular and normal way, they are always replaced at last by unwholesome and monstrous satisfaction. This is a natural and consequently fatal and irresistible law, under the disastrous action of which inevitably fall all Christian priests, and especially those of the Roman Catholic Church. It cannot apply to the professors, that is to the priests of the modern church, unless they are also obliged to preach Christian abstinence and renunciation. But there is another contradiction, common to the priests of both sects. This contradiction grows out of the very title and position of the master. A master who commands, oppresses and exploits is a wholly logical and quite natural personage. But a master who sacrifices himself to those who are subordinated to him by his divine or human privilege is a contradictory and quite impossible being. This is the very constitution of hypocrisy, so well personified by the Pope, who, while calling himself the lowest servant of the servants of God, in token whereof, following the example of Christ, he even washes once a year the feet of twelve Roman beggars, proclaims himself at the same time vicar of God, absolute and infallible master of the world. Do I need to recall that the priests of all churches, far from sacrificing themselves to the flocks confided to their care, have always sacrificed them, exploited them, and kept them in the condition of a flock, partly to satisfy their own personal passions and partly to serve the omnipotence of the church. Like conditions, like causes, always produce like effects. It will, then, be the same with the professors of the modern school, divinely inspired and licensed by the state. They will necessarily become, some without knowing it, others with full knowledge of the cause, teachers of the doctrine of popular sacrifice to the power of the state and to the profit of the privileged classes. Must we then eliminate from society all instruction and abolish all schools? Far from it. Instruction must be spread among the masses without stint, transforming all the churches, all those temples dedicated to the glory of God and to the slavery of men, into so many schools of human emancipation. But, in the first place, let us understand each other. Schools, properly speaking, in a normal society founded on equality and on respect for human liberty, will exist only for children and not for adults. And in order that they may become schools of emancipation and not of enslavement, it will be necessary to eliminate, first of all, this fiction of God, the eternal and absolute enslaver. The whole education of children and their instruction must be founded on the scientific development of reason, not on that of faith, on the development of personal dignity and independence, not on that of piety and obedience, on the worship of truth and justice at any cost, and above all on the respect for humanity, which must replace always and everywhere the worship of divinity. The principle of authority in the education of children constitutes the natural point of departure. It is legitimate, necessary, when applied to children of a tender age, whose intelligence has not yet openly developed itself. But as the development of everything, and consequently of education, implies the gradual negation of the point of departure, this principle must diminish as fast as education and instruction advance, giving place to increasing liberty. All rational education is at bottom nothing but this progressive emolliation of authority for the benefit of liberty. The final object of education necessarily being the formation of free men full of respect and love for the liberty of others. Therefore, the first day of the pupil's life, if the school takes infants scarcely able as yet to stammer a few words, should be that of the greatest authority and an almost entire absence of liberty. But its last day should be that of the greatest liberty and the absolute abolition of every vestige of the animal or divine principle of authority. 
The principle of authority, applied to men who have surpassed or attained their majority, becomes a monstrosity, a flagrant denial of humanity, a source of slavery and intellectual and moral depravity. Unfortunately, paternal governments have left the masses to wallow in an ignorance so profound that it will be necessary to establish schools not only for the people's children, but for the people themselves. From these schools will be absolutely eliminated the smallest applications or manifestations of the principle of authority. They will be schools no longer. They will be popular academies, in which neither pupils nor masters will be known, where the people will come freely to get, if they need it, free instruction, and in which, rich in their own experience, they will teach in their turn many things to the professors, who shall bring them knowledge which they lack. This, then, will be a mutual instruction, an act of intellectual fraternity between the educated youth and the people. The real school for the people, and for all grown men, is life. The only grand and omnipotent authority, at once natural and rational, the only one which we may respect, will be that of the collective and public spirit of a society founded on equality and solidarity, and the mutual human respect of all its members. Yes, this is an authority which is not at all divine, wholly human, but before which we shall bow willingly, certain that, far from enslaving them, it will emancipate men. It will be a thousand times more powerful, be sure of it, than all your divine, theological, metaphysical, political and judicial authorities established by the Church and by the State, more powerful than your criminal codes, your jailers and your executioners. The power of collective sentiment or public spirit is even now a very serious matter. The men most ready to commit crimes rarely dare to defy it, to openly affront it. They will seek to deceive it, but will take care not to be rude with it unless they feel the support of a minority, larger or smaller. No man, however powerful he believes himself, will ever have the strength to bear the unanimous contempt of society. No one can live without feeling himself sustained by the approval and esteem of at least some portion of society. A man must be urged on by an immense and very sincere conviction in order to find courage to speak and act against the opinion of all, and never will a selfish, depraved and cowardly man have such courage. Nothing proves more clearly than this fact the natural and inevitable solidarity, this law of sociability, which binds all men together, as each of us can verify daily, both on himself and on the men whom he knows. But, if this social power exists, why has it not sufficed hitherto to moralise, to humanise men? Simply because hitherto this power has not been humanised itself. It has not been humanised because the social life of which it is ever the faithful expression is based, as we know, on the worship of divinity, not on respect for humanity, on authority, not on liberty, on privilege, not on equality, on the exploitation, not on the brotherhood of men, on iniquity and falsehood, not on justice and truth. Consequently, its real action, always in contradiction of the humanitarian theories which it professes, has constantly exercised a disastrous and depraving influence. It does not repress vices and crimes, it creates them. Its authority is consequently a divine anti-human authority. Its influence is mischievous and baleful. Do you wish to render its authority and influence beneficent and human? Achieve the social revolution. Make all needs really solidary. And cause the material and social interests of each to conform to the human duties of each. And to this end there is but one means. Destroy all the institutions of inequality. Establish the economic and social equality of all. And on this basis will arise the liberty, the morality, the solitary humanity of all. I shall return to this, the most important question of socialism. End footnote. End of part one of chapter two.
This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.